Hi. Welcome to week one. This week we'll be learning about dramaturgical performances. You are expected to read the introduction and chapter one of Irving Goffman's The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. I love this book, and I hope you will too. It's all about understanding the social rules governing our interactions. Goffman offers a framework for thinking about these social rules in terms of what's appropriate or inappropriate behavior in a given situation. Basically, Goffman argues that our behavior depends on the situations in which we find ourselves. I think Professor Timming can probably do a better job explaining dramaturgy. Over to you, Andrew. Oh, well, thanks, Irving. Yeah, well, as he was just saying, we'll be spending the next, say, six weeks or so exploring the riches of Goffman's The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. I read this book when I was an undergraduate, and now here I am, passing it on to you as undergraduates. It's a fantastic read. I can't think of another book that did so much to change the way that I think about my place in the world. Um, from my perspective, it was truly a revolutionary book, and I hope you think it is too. Now, before I get into the lecture, I just want to give you a brief history of Irving Goffman's life. Uh, Goffman was born in 1922, and he died in 1982. He's a Canadian social psychologist who spent most of his working life in the United States. He has a PhD from the University of Chicago, and in fact, he did his doctoral field work in the Shetland Islands, which are located uh, just north of Scotland. They're quite isolated. So the book that you're reading, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, is actually based on his field work uh, that he conducted in the Shetlands. So Goffman was widely considered by many of his contemporaries to be something of an obnoxious genius. He spent his entire career trying to understand the social rules governing our behaviors. And in doing so, he was constantly violating these rules as a kind of ongoing social experiment, right? So he would say and do really, really inappropriate things when meeting people. He was super offensive towards others, not because he was a bad person, but rather just because he wanted to understand how they would react to his rule breaking. So when meeting people, for example, instead of saying, how do you do? My name's Irving. He would say something like, well, aren't you ugly? Or, hey, shithead, my name's Irving. Yeah, he was kind of a jerk, but he was also a genius. So he wrote several important books, and I think the most important of which is The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, which was published in 1959. Uh, he also wrote a book called Asylums in 1961 and Stigma in 1963, which we'll be learning about later, uh, and also his magnum opus, Frame analysis was written in 1974. So we're also going to learn a bit about frame analysis in this class, but I'm not going to force you to read that book. Because whereas The Presentation of Self is a pretty short and fun book to read, frame analysis is like 800 pages of basically impenetrable text. So you can thank me for that later. Okay, without further ado, let's begin our first lecture on Goffman's The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. Okay, this is one of my favorite books, and I like it because it's at the same time humorous, but also a bit dark and disturbing. You may never look at other people in the same way after you're done reading it, and my guess is that your trust in others may be severely depleted. You can use this book as a handbook of sorts on how to effectively and strategically interact with other people. So it can be especially useful, I think, in the context of work and employment. My feeling is that nearly everyone who is successful in the labor market, I'm talking about CEOs, consultants, and politicians, etc., implicitly understand the contents of this book. In fact, it is precisely because they understand the principles underlying human behavior that they have reached those high positions in organizations and in society. Let's start with the big picture. So Goffman argues that the self is a myth. There is no such thing as you. 
in many ways, you are as real as Irving, my avatar, which is to say that you're not real at all. I mean, think about this question for a moment. Who are you? Who am I? It sounds a bit like a philosophical question, but it's actually a very practical one. Who are you? Now, you might be thinking, I'm John or I'm Sally or whatever. Okay. But Goffman would argue that there is no such thing as John or Sally because of the complexity of the human psyche. Now, my name is Andrew, and I may assume that that's my identity, that that's my self. I identify as Andrew, but Goffman would argue that there is no one Andrew, but rather just a series of presentations of Andrew in different social contexts. For example, I present myself as one way to my mother, uh, but I show a completely different side of myself to my students. I would say and do things in front of my mom that I wouldn't say and do in front of my students. The key here is context. In my own house, I might walk around in my underpants, but I would never do that in the university because the rules for the presentation of self are different at work than they are at home. I may present embarrassing or humiliating sides of my personality to my friends, but not to my coworkers or to my boss. For example, in front of my friends, it may be perfectly acceptable for me to let out a fart, but I wouldn't do that in front of my colleagues or my students. The key argument here that I want you to take away from this slide is that there is no such thing as you, but rather just different versions of you that change depending on the situation or the circumstances in which you find yourself. This is fundamental to Goffman's theory of dramaturgy. So what is dramaturgy exactly? It's a theoretical lens that can be used to understand human behavior and interactions. Shakespeare once said, and I'm quoting, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and entrances and one man in his time plays many parts, end quote. This is from As You Like It. It perfectly encapsulates dramaturgy in my view. Goffman was a micro theorist rather than a macro theorist. He focused his research on small groups and even dyads, which means interaction between only two people at a time, the most basic form of interaction that there is. Now at the most fundamental level, Goffman argues that we are all actors in every single performance. And we try to define the situation primarily out of self-interest. So when we enter a social situation or social interaction, according to Goffman, we're trying to benefit from it in some way, oftentimes at the expense of others. That's why dramaturgy has been called qualitative game theory in the past. Game theory is a mathematical way of modeling social interaction based on potential cooperation, competition, and defection. Dramaturgy presents a similar model, but without the mathematics. Basically, we enter into a situation and try to define it for our benefit. We perform on the front stage and we prepare for performances on the backstage. We play parts, we memorize scripts, and we also use props, according to Goffman. I think a job interview is a perfect example of dramaturgy. We prepare for it ahead of time, but we try to make our behavior appear spontaneous. We rehearse potential questions in advance. We get all dressed up and we put our best foot forward. We present the best possible impression that we can. And we make sure to hide those parts of ourselves that would be incompatible with the job. According to Goffman, after the job interview, we don't go back to our real selves because there is no real self. We just move on to our next performance and the next and the next and the next. And so it is that we live our lives. Let's talk about first impressions. Think about the last time that you met a stranger, someone you don't know. How could you tell whether they were friend or foe? 
Think about it for a second. When we first meet others, we know nothing about their personality or their character. So what we do is to look for visual cues that can tell us something about that person. These appearance signals include cues to, for example, socioeconomic status, trustworthiness, and competencies. We use these cues to predict others' behaviors. For example, let's say you walk into a building and see someone with a white coat and a stethoscope around his neck. You might well think that this person is trustworthy and competent because he's a doctor. Later, you see someone with a black leather jacket and tattoos on the neck. You may well reach different conclusions about that person. So how we present ourselves to the world can help us define the situation in a way that is favorable to us. According to Goffman, the aim of all social interaction is to project or to foster the definition of the situation and to maintain a working consensus about what's going on here. For example, I'm a doctor. You can trust me when I tell you to take this medicine. We'd probably believe the man in the white coat, but not the one with the leather jacket and tattoos on his neck. In order to define the situation, we use both honest signaling, for example, I really am a doctor, and dishonest signaling, which is to say, I'm not a doctor, but I want you to believe that I'm a doctor. So Goffman would argue that most everyone resorts to lies and fabrications on occasion in order to manage others' impressions of them. We make these lies and fabrications frequently, and when they are revealed, we are discredited, and the definition of the situation essentially breaks down, often humorously, as you'll see throughout these lectures. According to Goffman, others don't necessarily need to believe that our impressions are true, but they need to act as though our impressions are true in order for the performance to be successful. In other words, it's the impression that counts, not the reality. Okay, let's take just a few moments to go through some of the key dramaturgical terms that you'll find in the first couple of chapters of the presentation of self. This is not a complete list of terms from those chapters, uh, but they are some of the most important concepts that you should familiarize yourself with before moving forward. <clears throat> so Goffman refers to a sign vehicle as a carrier of information about an individual. So for example, we're talking about appearances that can give rise to stereotypes. For example, a suit uh, projects professionalism in the context of a job interview. Impressions given refer to actual words that we use in social interaction, whereas impressions given off refer to the nonverbal, theatrical context signaling within interactions. Goffman refers to getting off on the right foot as initiating an interaction with an effective first impression. We want to start off on the right foot. Defensive practices are defined as strategies and practices used to protect a projection that we wish to convey to others. Protective practices, or also referred to as tact, refers to strategies and practices used to save the definition of a situation projected by another. He defines interaction or encounter as the reciprocal influence of individuals upon one another's actions when in one another's immediate physical presence. And he defines performance as all the activity of a given participant on a given occasion, which serves to influence in any way any of the other participants. <clears throat> he refers to a part or a routine as the pre-established pattern of action, which is unfolding during a performance. Okay, so what can we conclude based on these terms? Everything we wear, from shoes to tattoos, conveys information to others. We project ourselves to others, not only with our words, but also with our expressions. Anytime we enter a social situation, 
we always want to get off on the right foot because it's hard to recover from a poor performance. We use a series of protective practices to defend the impression that we want to create for others. By the same token, sometimes we exercise tact when another's performance is going poorly, but we don't want them to fail. In every social encounter, we play parts or roles aimed at defining the situation and giving a successful performance. Okay, let's take a little break and do an exercise on how to apply some of these concepts to social relations in the workplace. So I'm now going to hand it back to my avatar, Irving.